What happened in 1994, of course, was uh, on the scale that uh, no one imagined. Um, but we had had a history of killings in Rwanda since uh, 1959. In fact, during that period, we became refugees. There were many killings between 1959 and 1961. So many killings were, had been taking place, and that's how people ran to different parts of the region. They were running away from these uh, political killings. But throughout the years, up to the time uh, we started the armed struggle in 1990, there had been oppression, there had been killings of people, targeted people all along a section of our population was the target from those 60s and up to that moment. And um, so, this, but the scale of this one was uh, more than anyone could imagine. But during the fighting, during 1990-94, what was happening? 91, 92, 93, there were always indications that something like happened in many years before could, could easily happen. Because the government was so much uh, whipping up sentiments, ethnic sentiments, and saying these people who are returning, they are the same people who, you know, survived the, the killings of early 60s and so on. So, you know, after all, these are foreigners. They, we shouldn't be allowed to, to go back home. You know, they should stay where they are. The country is very small. You know, it's only for another section of the population of Rwanda, not for these ones who are foreigners. And you could see they were building up this. and. and and in fact, they started arresting people, they started killing them uh, in different parts of the country. Those who had stayed in the country were, were never refugees, but who were, were identified as this group that, that they should exterminate. It was 61, then 66, many killings, then 73, so many killings. In fact, I had uh, some of my sisters had stayed, uh, I have four sisters, and I had a brother who died in uh, the struggle in Uganda. Uh, but two of my sisters had stayed in the country with relatives. They didn't flee with us, they stayed with those who stayed. So, but in 1973, they actually ran away. This time they became refugees because they almost uh, killed them. So you can see there the, the were killings in the 61, there were killings in the 73, and then there were killings this time. And as I mentioned to you, uh, so uh, unless one could easily say, uh, if the war had not started, if we hadn't waged an armed struggle, probably that would not have happened. But that would only be leaving it to saying, no, they could kill like they killed in 61, they could kill as they killed in, 60, in 73. Uh, so let, let those... Uh, Killings of a certain low number, small number, continue, and, and let's also continue with the people having no right to their country. Maybe this is the best way to manage it. So, if we hadn't, maybe if we hadn't waged an armed struggle, maybe these things wouldn't have happened. I have come to settle to the idea and understanding that uh, problems of any country or later on our own, I mean, if we start with mine, my country, 
and my country's problems, they will never be settled by people from outside. Never. I, I, I haven't known of any country where problems of this kind are resolved from outside <laughs> rather than uh, the people themselves from inside. I haven't, I don't know of any example. So, uh, the outside having not helped, well, we, we can spend a lot of time blaming people or others, but it, they are not expected to do it anyway from experience. That's what I know, that it, it won't be resolved. I've uh, found some logic that helps me to not uh, spend so much time blaming people, other people. Uh, first, the genocide much as even the origin of it was contributed from outside. It has a history, you can trace it from outside. Uh, but it couldn't work unless conditions inside of the country uh, allowed it to, to take the shape it did. So in other words, we are to blame too, we Rwandans. And, and in the end, whoever, even if it came from outside, maybe people from outside were very clever to start something and let us be the one <laughs> to carry it out. <laughs> and they would be outside uh, as innocent people who would come to rescue us when they are the ones who actually started it. You see my point? So if we hadn't really you know, taking on this kind of politics that divides our society, that later on ended into a genocide. We ourselves, if we hadn't, meaning the Rwandans who were in, in power from independence up to the time this happened. Uh, for us, the 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 the. the the blame, if one may call it so, I meaning the, the, from outside, we, the refugees, is that we fought a war to liberate our country, to liberate our, ourselves. Maybe somebody can argue, said we shouldn't have done that. But <laughs> my question would be, what did you want me to do? <laughs> well, if somebody can say, I don't know, you should have stayed as Ugandan. <laughs> And, and they become a Ugandan, yeah, but there's somebody else somewhere, yes. I was more than happy to, to, to get involved in, from the beginning. And um, by the way, as we, we agreed, risking my own life like many other people risked and even lost their lives. Uh, this was something much bigger than just uh, feeling comfortable in Uganda where I was or somebody else, wherever they were, and saying, no, no, no. Uh, this had gone on for too long. We were stateless, we were refugees. We, had, we, we couldn't just allow ourselves to live uh, uh, on the mercy of people <laughs> where we were refugees or where or somebody to decide what happens to us and what should not happen to us. No, no, no. no this was something that any of us was happy to have stood up and fought against. Very happy, very proud that um, Apart from the loss of many lives and uh, which can never be corrected or can, you know, we can't do much about it. It's probably the most expensive part of the struggle and uh, yeah, but to have won the war and won the peace for ourselves because if you look at those years of the war, of the genocide, and, and they are brought to, to an end, and then we start rebuilding, and rebuilding in the sense of 
uh, reconciliation in the sense of allowing Rwandans to live together as a nation and now a proud people of Rwanda uh, and socially made progress, politically significant progress, economically the same. I think we, we, we could not have asked for more. It will never be one single thing. It's, it's normally going to be a, a combination of things, but it builds around uh, a determination, a single-mindedness of uh, all of us coming together and saying we need to change the course uh, of history and politics in our country. And we are one nation, we, we, we are different, we will be different, but we can use this difference to, to build rather than destroy what belongs to all of us. Uh, and um, so that, that organization, that coming together, that vision, uh, you know, and, and deciding that this is what we deserve is really, so, for that, you need to have a vision, leadership, and organization. Organization which brings in people to be part of that vision and the feel they own it. It's painful, it's uh, very hard even to explain, and, uh, but um, in fact, I remember on one occasion, we are commemorating genocide every day, every year we do it, every 7th of April, of every year we, we do that, we remember our people and I, 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 I remember there was a story, indeed, the, the survivors and others were you know, agitated and rightly so and were saying, you know, you know, it's like the, the, the story or, or, or the cost of reconciliation is only carried by them. Meaning they are the ones who lost people and they are the ones who suffered, but they are always asked to do something so that the reconciliation process uh, succeeds. And I had to engaged them at various levels and had a discussion with them. And they had even to make a public speech on that day, telling people that, first of all, we hear them. We, we are part of them. It's, it's not that we are dealing with a foreign situation or a foreign you know, idea or anything. It, it's us. <laughs> they and us are the same. <laughs> There's no distinction. And that the reason they feel uh, or anybody would see that they are the ones carrying the burden is, is to be explained only by one. And, and I put it to them, I said, yes, I can come to you and look you in the eyes and ask you, to forgive and not forget, and I am with you on that. But it's only you that I can ask that, and it's, it's only you that can be asked to do something about this story of Rwanda, because I can't go to the perpetrators and ask them anything. There is nothing to ask from them. I can't go to these ones who killed who are in prison or who are wherever they are and say, please, you know, forgive us next time we don't behave like this. And no, they, they say there's nothing to ask from these people. They are condemned, they killed, carried out a genocide, they are bad people. We just have to decide what to do about that. But, and, and we don't even have to ask 
uh, their consent because they have condemned themselves to being in a situation where forgiveness, they should be forgiven or they should be tried. So there is nothing to ask of these people, but there is a lot to ask from you. So and, and this conversation, you know, helped people to understand and say, oh, this is why we carry the burden. And they said, you, we lost people. Your people are our people. I lost many relatives in the genocide. So when I'm saying this, I'm with you, I'm one of you. And so, but we need to live beyond this tragic story. <laughs> we don't need more. And the only way is to ask you, is to ask ourselves to, to forgive but not forget. I go there physically. I go. I travel there. I go and people gather, and I have a direct conversation with them. I, I can't have a conversation through radio or television or anything. No, it, it, the message just just doesn't go through, or it looks like it is superficial. So I want one on one, and that's what I do, and that's is very effective. And and people there also, you know live when they are happy that they, they, they saw each other and they could ask questions, the hard questions, and I could explain and, you know, give them a perspective they did not have before that. We pushed that from the beginning to have women uh, be in their rightful place. Uh, and and they, from the beginning, even in our conversations with different people, the leaders of our country at different levels, I have always emphasized that this is not doing them a favor. We're not doing women any favors. It's, it's their right. We're only allowing them to, to, to have their rights. And in fact, I say, I would even joke, I say, if, if these women were like me, growing up and having to take up arms to, to fight for my right, maybe these women should take up arms and really fight those who are denying them their rights. But the situation is such that we can handle it differently. They didn't need to be... There is no need for there to be fights. Generally, women are 52% of our population, right? And from what I said, that being their right, I think if you give 52% of our population their right, <laughs> that's already a big thing, that's huge. But now in the parliament, 64%. So I'm just saying, even if things just remain the same, that these are just rights being realized, uh, you, you, you're you already gaining. But now, 52% of the population uh, empowered and being part of uh, you know whatever is happening in the country, you gain socially, you gain economically, you gain in all ways. Now, when we have them in, 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 in the parliament, 64%, and the parliament making laws and so on, they are already helping this transformation. Well, I, I don't want to think about that from such a stage because it might even create problems for her. <laughs> or, 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 you know, there is no need because I may mention somebody and then after that I realize there are so many other women who probably deserve or, or are more qualified. So I, I wouldn't want to do that. I, 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 that should happen at the right time and that is you know, every time you are scanning and looking around and wanting to see, you know, 
the evolution of things and then people as they cut out different. There are so many women uh, at leadership level, level uh, and they are doing the amazing things. You know, they, they, are, they are part of this success story of Rwanda. And uh, you don't want to zero on one woman so early and when there are so many who are really wonderful women who come. Well, as there are women, uh, men, men, there are many. When we are talking about women and so on, we are not really saying that men uh, uh, aren't uh, there or useful or, or considered. But I think we have, we are, we, men have dominated this for a long time. From uh, the earliest part of my life, at the age of uh, close to four, four years old, that's when my family went into exile. Uh, that was around the 61. That's when we became refugees uh, in Uganda. Uh, lived in a refugee camp. Uh, camps shifted, went to different parts of Uganda as refugees, but anyway, life was the same. It was living in refugee camp. And of course, that was very difficult from whatever angle you look at it. The family myself and others, many other Rwandans who had gone into exile at the time. So the growing under those conditions uh, was quite an experience that shaped people, their thinking, and even, uh, you know, uh, later on, I mean, it was both physical and <laughs> many things. I was a refugee for 25 years, so almost the first part, 15, 20 years were, were difficult. There's no question about it. Uh, the conditions under which we lived, uh, whether it was feeding as in the family or going to school, I mean, we used to move uh, on foot distances covering 10, about 10 kilometers, sometimes more, back and forth. Uh, and, and so every aspect of life was, was complicated. Well, my first job, um, actually ended up, uh, so to speak, my first job being in the military because I started getting involved in, I don't know what to say, whether it is politics or, or the business of the struggle, when I was 20 years old uh, in Uganda. I got involved in the uh, struggles in Uganda. In fact, I got involved in uh, the armed struggle in Uganda from uh, 81 uh, to end of 85, 1985. Uh, then became uh, a member of the uh, military, the army in Uganda for, from 86 uh, to 1990. Those conditions started shaping uh, my thinking or the thinking of those who were in that kind of condition. Uh, and, and that's how, in the end, we came to join the Ugandan army. It's, it's a complicated in a sense because we were refugees in Uganda, then later on Uganda had changes. Uh, there was uh, Obote, Idamin, uh, overthrew him, then later on uh, Amin was removed from power, and then 
these different struggles uh, affected us. When you're a refugee, you are stateless. You don't belong anywhere. You're just uh, under that. And of course, in the end, director and director, you are affected, for example, at school, uh, known as refugees, and you know, sometimes for anything that happened, anyone finds it easy to say, you know, it's because of these uh, you know, refugees or non-citizens who are part of it. People at work, if, if they have no job, they think the refugees have taken their place uh, in the job market. Uh, all kinds of pretexts happened. In fact, not just to me personally, but to everyone who was in that category. There, there, there was always a story about that. And uh, I tell you, I remember in uh, uh, 1977, 78, uh, I had wanted to be, I was, for some reason, I had uh, liking for airplanes. I, I, I wanted to become either a pilot or an aircraft engineer or something that was always in my mind. So I went for competition when they called people to, you know, they were recruiting pilots for what existed as East African Airways. But I was in Uganda, part of it. So uh, I went there and uh, did the exams. And I was actually one of the few who passed the exams from so many. There were aptitude tests, you know, carried out in mathematics, physics, and, you know, so I, I passed that. And um, so when we, uh, called those who had passed the exams to report and so when I arrived uh, at uh, a place uh, the, someone looked at me and just by my features I think he could tell that uh, I'm Rwandese therefore not the Rwandese of uh, Ugandan citizenship but a refugee. Uh, so I asked for my identity card, I gave it and cross-checked, found I was the one who had actually passed and he said, uh, what are you doing here? I said, well, I came and did exams, now I've just reported like you called people to report. So the person was very angry with me, almost kicking me out of the door of the room and said, you don't belong here, you, you're, not, you, you're not Ugandan. At that time, I think the thinking was more or less blurred by anger, so to speak. You know, the fellow almost tore my identity card. It was a school identity card. And uh, so I said, get out of here. So I was hesitating and say, why, why are you treating me like this? And the guy stood up almost, uh, charging at me, and so uh, I walked out. And from that time, you know, for, for a long time, it never stopped ringing in my mind that, uh, you know, this kind of situation is something one doesn't need to experience in, in their lives. But there it was with me and I could imagine it was the same with many of my colleagues who were for in other places. And um, yeah, so I never forgot that moment. I think it had a huge impact on, on uh, my life and uh, different experiences in my life or even in making decisions. Uh, first, I, I, I understood firsthand the problems of being a refugee. Second, it occurred to me nobody needed to experience that kind of thing. Uh, three, uh, I thought uh, whatever I would be doing, whatever my responsibilities would uh, involve, I would always 
try and find a way of uh, addressing that problem even for other people. Uh, in fact, later on, so many years after even my position of responsibility, my country is one that uh, uh, treats refugees from other countries. We have many of them from Burundi, from DRC, uh, that's Congo, from different parts. We, we try as much to treat them uh, very fairly. And uh, in fact, we have even suggested to them if they want to become citizens of our country, we will be happy to use our laws to make them so. So if they prefer to stay like that because they may be hope and want to go back to their countries, still it's okay. But And we have given them pieces of land. We take, they enjoy education like our own citizens. Uh, they even get employment. And there is no such a thing as discriminating against them as refugees. And, and it has a relationship with what happened to me as well decades ago. When I was starting primary education, uh, I think for the first three years we were studying under a tree. Not only were we studying under a tree, it was uh, ridiculous because uh, we used it to write on our thighs. We didn't have exercise books, we had no pens. We used to use uh, dry, you know, uh, pieces of grass or, or something hard and, you know, to write, to learn to write on our thighs and you would, you know, carry you know, your thigh to the teacher to show how you... <laughs> Later on, we, we are prograded that too by when we started getting something like Sometimes it would be offered by a friend, a relative, or a big. We would use uh, 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 banana leaves, you know, green, and so you can write on them. So we used to use banana leaves to write uh, notes and <laughs> do things and do. <laughs> So, uh, and of course, there are no classrooms. We would be under tree indeed, just, uh, and uh, yeah, we used to pass uh, our days like that. And sometimes getting a meal, uh, one meal a day was difficult. We would study and go home and, yeah. So it was, it was a bit difficult, but we, we went through all that. My family, both my father and my mother, were very good at that. And um, they always, you know, even under those conditions, they would uh, always remind us, have you thought about this? Have you, are you thinking about school? You must study. It was every day instruction almost. If we were leaving home, going to school, it's like make sure you and for me, uh, of course, uh, 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 parents, I, I used to think parents were harder on me than my siblings because uh, they used to get reports back from school that I was stubborn. I was, you know, sometimes I, I'm out of class playing uh, you know, football when others are studying. And, but what used to save me was that uh, for all those years, I, always, I would always come top of my class. So, but still, my parents would uh, sometimes not be forgiving. They, when they learned from uh, the teachers that uh, I was very stubborn, I was, you know, involved in you know, petty fights with colleagues and very, very naughty at school they would still really not be very kind to me. Discipline also came from uh, my parents. Uh, I think I, I outgrew my stubbornness and being cheeky and not around with kids, uh, my age mates. Um, 
So, and then, of course, as I was growing under these conditions, as we said, and being affected by them and being angry at, uh, you know, just that happening to me and others, and even my family and my parents as I was seeing it, and always wondering what we needed to do. I think that became a transition to switching from mm -hmm. just the usual routine of, you know, being the child that everyone wants to be. And now I do, uh, I, I do exercise, uh, I do workouts. Uh, the, the, the alcohol I drink, drink today, sometimes I take a sip on wine or things when, you know, the environment detects that for dinners, for, but it's really more or less to fit in with the, the environment. But w long before that, I wasn't drinking. I, I never drank alcohol or smoked, no. Though my father was a very heavy smoker, and I think probably it's part of what uh, took his life, was uh, he used to smoke heavily. I think it must be a combination of two things. It must be these conditions under which I grew, and then my parents demanding that, you know, they always insisted we have discipline of us children. I was born in a family of six children. I was, I'm the youngest. And uh, discipline, respect for people, and even respect for ourselves, they, they really emphasized that a lot. They were always, and I think that stuff, there's no question about it. We, we, I, I got a big dose of it from, from that environment, from my parents, what they emphasized. Sometimes I would go off track and wasn't, uh, you know, fitting in what the demands they were making, but that doesn't mean it wasn't having effect on me, <laughs> absolutely. Maybe I was absorbing it even without realizing. So when I grew up, I could see that had, had impact. So, but two things I think, it's always going to be the conditions maybe under which one grows, the, the environment, the conditions and so on. But the other part is uh, the nature in the end, the personality that one can't claim is responsible for. Sometimes it is just in you, as, as they say, it's a nature and a nurture that they are combined to shape this. So I think I got a big dose of that myself. First, I'm in Uganda, I'm in the army in Uganda. I, I was uh, at the rank of a major uh, in the army. Uh, and uh, in fact, going to the position at Fort Leavenworth was meant for somebody's. And uh, something happened. The government or the commander-in-chief or the commander of the army in Uganda changed their mind and last minute and decided that I was the one to go. So I wasn't even given time to prepare. I think it was like a, I was informed on a Friday and I was being told to leave on a Tuesday next week. So I had only a weekend. <laughs> but uh, being in the institution where I was, uh, used to taking orders and no, there was no questioning, so I just asked me, are you ready? I said, I'm ready. I took a plane, went through Kenya, Nairobi, then flew. Uh, I remember experience, I think uh, I, I had uh, a stop before I went to Fort Rivers in Chicago, the airport. That's where I landed and it was like... Uh, <laughs> A place I had never imagined to be in, so, and I was alone, so I was finding my way. And anyway, later on, we reached Kansas at Fort Leavenworth, so I was received very well. The environment is also good, but I found there other uh, 
officers who had come from uh, different countries then uh, on the continent uh, from Senegal from Nigeria from Kenya uh, there was one from Malawi and so on so I made it reconnect, made it reconnected with them and you know so it, it was easy for, 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 for me to cope but then studies uh, there was no problem I was doing a lot of reading you know military science it's about tactics it's strategy it's about uh, uh, I, I thought it was very interesting for me, given what we had gone through uh, in the years fighting wars uh, uh, in Uganda and the experience, the environment. So it, I think it was coming together quite well. I, I think um, some of the things I had just experienced but could not interpret or, you know, relate very easily uh, with the actual, you know, science or the art behind it. I, I was able to, to do that in, in a few months I was there, because I was there, I think, only for five months. Before I left, we had already been planning uh, things. And um, up to the time I left, I knew what was going on. We communicated with the people in Uganda on the ground, and uh, yeah, so I, I was following almost on a regular basis. Uh, even at the time, uh, they were started in Rwanda. Uh, I was briefed, and so I left knowing that at a certain point when it starts, I wasn't sure of the date because even. Others I left behind weren't sure they were to work on, which would be the best timing for that. Uh, but when the best timing was identified, I was formed. And, uh, so all along, I, I was to leave college and join uh, when things started, when the fighting started. So that's what I did. My role was linked with what I used to be even in the organization before. Before in the organization, before I left for Fort Leavenworth, there are no formal positions as such, but, and, and we avoided that so that we, 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 you know, it doesn't end up in the wrong place, and, but we had a way of communicating among ourselves. But I was one of the top three at the time. Uh, yeah, so to speak, also maybe number two. Uh, there was somebody who was senior to me who had started from the beginning. And uh, when the war started, I was supposed to come and join anyway, not bothered by which position I'm holding or anything. It was that one we would figure out when we reach the ground. Uh, so the leader, that one who was heading us, was our commander. He was the head of the organization, the Rwandese Patriotic Front, but was also uh, the commander of the forces. Was actually killed on the second day of of, of the invasion in Rwanda. So the, 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 the army, the institution, the, the, the fighters remained without uh, a leader. But at that is the time I was also planning to leave Fort Leavenworth. And, and, and so naturally, it, even what was expected on the ground was that since he had, you know, the first leader was killed, I was coming to take over. It's funny because in those moments, you are not even thinking about what is going to happen to you. Uh, the, the, 
body and mind were so charged about doing something that you weren't bothered what is likely to happen, what could happen. My mind was, one, I was going to join uh, the activities that were there, that had started uh, the armed struggle, and uh, I wasn't bothered about what position or what I was, about, I was going to hold. Uh, I wasn't even thinking about what could easily happen to me like it happened to others because already the commander had been killed. We have had um, uh, stories going on by human rights groups, by some people in the media, and so on and so forth. But if fairness was part of this life we lead and across the board in the world, one, it should have been clear long ago that there are lots of contradictions, serious contradictions in these stories uh, peddled by human rights groups and others. Contradictions, open contradictions. There is nothing that has been happening in Rwanda that suggests a situation of dictatorship or of uh, violation of human rights or, or gagging the press or anything. Really, in the last, take the last 23 years. Uh, and, and to say that everything else is, is it's fine, it's going well, there's good progress almost in everything except this. <laughs> I think in a way we, we, we just leave it to look ridiculous on its own without even us, uh, and, and what we concentrate on is doing things so that the results tell the story. And um, the other, other than the results themselves, the other people who can tell the story are the people of Rwanda. And what is so unfortunate is that the human rights groups and, and some people in the media uh, can, I mean, they dare to tell Rwandans, the majority of them, the biggest majority of them, that they are wrong in what they are doing or in the choices they make. You know, today I tell people that you are wrong in your choices. You've got to explain who are you? Who, who are you who are saying you Rwandans are making a mistake? Who are to tell, let, let me say it this way. Uh, we had elections recently. Seven million people went for elections, and the majority of them, meaning 98% of seven million, made this free, open choice. Where they had come from, up to that point, they made elections. And they said it openly, publicly, there was, and even put to test of expressing it secretly. Because publicly you can say, oh, maybe there is influence, there is pressure, there is force. There. No, but secretly, people will tell you the truth. And the secretly, the secret ballot, by the way, inside the country and outside. Because we have uh, uh, people outside also voting. And the pattern remains the same. Room for opposition is there. That's why there is this 2%. <laughs> and the 2% is not in prison. <laughs> but I, see, I think also, the, you, you see, this is where the problem now has come. I mean, uh, do people, there is what we started 
talking about you know, in our discussion, the story of Rwanda. Does that matter? Does that create a context? You know, from where we, we started the 60s, the colonial times, the da, 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 division, and then, you know, the genocide and so on. Does this matter to anyone, to any observer from outside, so that they are able to put all this in context and therefore see this as a result of that? If we just want to look at it on its own, you say it's like there is an election in Rwanda, and uh, yeah, so it should happen like it happens anywhere else, like it happens in America, in UK, in France, and by the way, some of the happenings there are also not being so clear <laughs> to me <laughs> in those places. <laughs> We've unified the country, more or less really erased the, this ugly history of vision and that even led to a genocide and hatred and so on. And, and so we have solved political, social, and economic problems of our country and united the country. So we now need to keep concentrating on how do we you know, lead our country to prosperity, how do we enable, uh, how you know, Rwandans to realize, uh, realize their own aspirations, their ideals, themselves being a part of it, uh, and how do we allow this uh, to happen without actually contradicting now some of the things people talk about out of context. The, out of context because people talk about Rwanda, you know, they, they, this progress, very nice things, good governance, da, 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 then they end up with but. <laughs> but what? <laughs> That but should not be there because that is what even Rwandans are, are, are saying. It's not me saying it, by the way. In fact, even it's being said and realized by people from outside, other than these in human rights organizations or the media. The ordinary people of the whole world, the Americans, ordinary people from America, whether it is business or when they come to Rwanda, or Europeans, they, they can't, I mean, accept, admire what has been done, what has been achieved in such a short years. And by the way, these are people who really relate to ordinary people in Rwanda. They talk to them, they stay with them, they employ them, they, so they know the story. And, and they simply understand completely different from what these stories are in the media and with the human rights groups. You know, irrespective of what the accusations are against us, against me, or um, what anybody, you know, it, it will happen. Um, what should I say? But why should people be fixated on it <laughs> in the first place? You see, why, why, why? The people of Rwanda are writing their own story. They are, you know, living their own lives in the manner they have chosen that doesn't and shouldn't offend anyone. But it's for them, it's, 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 this, this country has suffered. And they've been working out a way to, to lead their lives, just like any other people of this world. And somebody keeps saying, no, no, no what, why is, when is this one going? When is this? <laughs> but, but how does this become part of the story and, and lives the people of Rwanda want to live?
it is being made fragile by these busy bodies, you know, these people who want to manage our politics. That's what would make it fragile. If you allow people from nowhere or from everywhere to dictate to, to, to a nation, to people how they should live their lives, that makes it fragile. That would be my worry. But I would be a fool if for all that person I have contributed to and done with my people, every day I, in what is being done or happening, we don't factor in that which will, you know, give us a more stable future. I would be a fool. And for anyone to really be more worried about it than I am, <laughs> I think it just doesn't make sense. This is what they tell to these people. They keep coming and say, no, no, they keep, you know, these so-called prophets of doom, it's like Rwanda, tomorrow is going to crash. And they really come with so many worries and suggestions and so on. But I think people should be humble enough to say, you know, these people, where they have come from, where they are now, maybe they know what they are doing. I think people should give us, meaning the whole country and the people of Rwanda, some benefit of the doubt that we really, first of all, we mean well for ourselves. We are the first learners of our own mistakes, if we have made them. And we are the ones interested more in our future. I'm on Twitter, not necessarily that I like it, but I'm there. <laughs> I think that, 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 that there may be that difference, but I'm on Twitter, I tweet, I back and forth with the people, we argue. We... In fact, it has served as a very good channel of communication. You know, some ordinary Rwandan tweets and raises an issue and I pick it and immediately, you know, whether it was an idea or a problem to solve or something, and it's worked on. And it has had a, a significant impact. It's, it's a very interesting thing. You know, you, you, you reach audiences, mm -hmm. timely, you know, there are no corners, there is no bureaucracy that is going to slow down the, the process of communication. It goes directly. It's, if it's an idea, you put it there and hundreds of thousands of people pick it straight that same moment. Uh, 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 and so whatever it is that you find you have identified would be served well by that, and there are many, then that's it. So it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting tool, and uh, it doesn't just reach people in the country. In fact, these followers aren't uh, uh, just from Rwanda. They are from across Africa and, and beyond. There are others beyond Africa. Uh, so it's like your, whatever idea you have, you communicate it, or you see what others are communicating so that you, you pick it and, and maybe use it for whatever good effect. One time, I think there is a journalist or something, hey, yeah, from the UK, tweeted something about me. Uh, and I thought, and it actually turned out to be, uh, it was a distortion about me, about my country, about who I am, and, and so on. So I took exception and actually tweeted back. And there was a, go, a, a, a long exchange back and forth that took some time. And many other people joined in and you know, it was really busy. Uh, but what I'm talking about that is, 
Now, this one, I think, was a journalist or something. You see, in UK. But it was as if he took offense that I actually uh, made clarification of what he was distorting. Now, and, and, and in that, I kept saying, no, but you, you talk about freedoms. You talk about freedom of expression. You talk about things. So, but it seems you, you say it only for you, but not for others. <laughs> because what is wrong if I am ready? Because, you know, you, know, Gami, you, know, you see, you know, he's, you know, he doesn't like criticism. And, uh, but he was actually showing he doesn't like criticism himself. <laughs> because he, he took offense by what I tried to clarify. I said, no, you are distorting things. You are, that's not who I am. That's not what... And I was exp only explaining. I didn't even I didn't insult him. I didn't do anything. But he took offense. He said, it's like, you know, I don't like criticism. No, but this was an argument. So if we, you want an argument, let's have an argument. Why should you be offended that I have pointed out that you are wrong? And, and not only that, but given you an answer. So th this was part of it. And for me, I enjoyed it. I don't want to sound like I'm, I'm judging Trump or anybody, but uh, I, I, I just concentrate on my style and what I used for. I'm not there too often, first of all. I'm not there every day. Uh, I pick moments when uh, there's something to say. I don't even, I have seen others, many others, even including other leaders, not Trump, but even in Africa and somewhere else, well, they just tweet everything they are doing. They are going somewhere, or they are saying this, or da da da. da. So it's always, uh, I don't do that. I don't use uh, my tweet account for that. But I do it once in a while if I'm replying to something that also selected that maybe deserves my response. I don't reply to any, everything. Uh, or I express an idea that I think I need to express, either on certain days that have meaning to, to me or to Rwanda and so on, I do that. So I'm very selective about it. To think that you know everything, you are right about everything, and <laughs> And you need to, to take charge of other people's lives and ways and uh, even ways of doing things. I don't think it is right. It's not. Uh, but they have good things people would wish to emulate or think about. Or... But why doesn't that come in a way of working together? Uh, you know, I, I, I actually liked what Trump had to say at one point. I, I think it was in his inaugural speech and then later on, to the effect that uh, I'm not quoting exactly, but the meaning of it was, you know, they don't seek, meaning America should not, or his administration should not be seeking to... Uh, dictate uh, to others uh, to, to, you know, change their ways and, and live like maybe Americans want to live their lives. But, very importantly, he said, let us be, uh, let us uh, uh, I think it was like, let us be the light, the shining light that can influence <laughs> people uh, to follow their ways. Here there is a, a, a distinction, which I think is the most important thing I'm pointing out. Instead of dictating to people to live in a certain way that you have decided for them, actually enable them to see the good in the way of your life and the way you live your life so that they are, they are attracted to it. 
they can actually, you know, emulate. It's what I mean. So, to the West, I would say, no, be the shining light that we can, you know, look at and like and and, and actually follow, <laughs> rather than <laughs> forcing people things down their throat of your way of life. This is, I think, the, the, the message is, uh, but there is uh, the other part of politics, as we know it. Powerful countries you know, want to take responsibility to, you know, make sure that, that uh, they, they help address problems uh, elsewhere. They, you know, they want to be present because anyway, in the end, if they don't, these things will affect them one way or the other. But again, it's not too difficult to choose the best way to do it. Yes. Almost everything starts and ends with people, our people. Involving people, investing in our people. It has been key. This is why I'm saying that progress, whether economic, or social, political, hasn't been happening by accident. It's because of the people of Rwanda who have come together. Therefore, the sure thing for, for Rwanda's future starts with investing in our people, and that is education. And then we mind their health. We mind that when this education gives them skills, knowledge, and actually allows the talent of our people at individual level, collectively, to show up, you know, to be there and, and have an effect uh, on uh, their future progress. So it's education has been key, but it is education to improve this person, the Rwandan, the people, so that they are able to move. It's a sure way. 20 years from now, Rwanda should be an upper middle income country. We are talking in terms of prosperity. Should be we are strongly united as a nation, should be free and independent in euro terms, meaning Rwandans must live their lives in a free way they have chosen, not chosen by others. And independent means also uh, with this prosperity, they should really be able to live on what uh, they are able to earn or, or create. Uh, so th this is for me the Rwanda. In 20 years, I think we should be there. With me or without me? <laughs> that, that, that's my hope.